So the next speakers will be Peter Barry from uh, UC Davis. Well, uh, thank you uh, to the organizers for allowing me to present our work that we've got going up at UC Davis. And what I'm going to talk about today is uh, two things. I'm going to end up talking about our specific research, which is focusing on vaccines against human cytomegalovirus, in particular targeting the viral IL-10 protein. But I also want to use it sort of to uh, highlight uh, in the beginning of my talk a general approach in which one tries to understand viral natural history and see if that teaches us lessons to guide us on how to make uh, vaccines, and particularly uh, lessons drawn from persistent pathogens. Now, um, I, the, the basic issue that we are working on is a vaccine against human cytomegalovirus, and Laura Hertel gave an excellent summary this morning about human CMV. Um, but one of the main issues I want to highlight is that the, there's, the efforts to design a vaccine against human CMV have been ongoing for 40 years, and we don't have a, a clinically approved vaccine for human CMV. And this is, uh, and I want to highlight what I think might be one of the first calls for a vaccine. This is done by Hanshaw, who have been studying congenital infection. And, he, and Hanshaw said, any thoughtful program aimed at prevention or treatment deserves consideration. Any thoughtful program. And um, I highlight that, uh, that, that phrase just because over the years, with calls every few decades until a recent study in, in 2009, the approach has been focusing on structural proteins, particularly those viral proteins, glycoprotein B, which induces uh, neutralizing antibodies uh, that block infection of fibroblast. Um, and what I want to highlight is maybe we need to modify the paradigm, and nature may be guiding us on how to do that. And so this slide, I just want to step back from what I'm working on to sort of this global uh, issues of persistent pathogens. And these are just some of the main pathogens that we all know about. Um, but highlighting these are persistent pathogens, viruses, protozoa, bacteria, and their global burden. And HIV is around 34 million, and it ranges from up to about a third to half the population are infected by persistent pathogens. Now, aside from a few uh, elite controllers in HIV who do not, who are able to control the virus, um, in, with all these other pathogens, not everybody who's infected shows symptoms. They do not necessarily develop disease. It says that in many of these people, many of the people infected with these pathogens, the immune system is able to contain the pathogen in such a way as to prevent uh, uh, overt symptom, symptoms and, and, and sequelae, saying that it is possible in the virus-host relationship for the immune system to do its job. Um, so one of the issues, though, is um, what is the mechanism of pathogen persistent? Because if in some instances people are able to control the pathogenic effects of the pathogen, how is that virus able to persist in an immune host that has immune responses that limit the ability of the virus to cause disease? So what lessons can we learn? Well, the response to any pathogen infection, which you learned in the first couple weeks of an immunology class, is that the innate immune cells listed here at the top respond to certain signals uh, of, the, of the invading pathogen. And this is a, an orchestrated response of different innate immune effector cells. They start secreting cytokines, chemokines, and other effector molecules. And eventually, you get a translation or a, a uh, uh, going from the innate to the adaptive immune response. And the, the nature, the kinetics, the, the type of, of adaptive immune response is really dictated by the, the quality uh, and nature of the innate immune response. And there are certain key players in this, and I want to focus on the interleukin-10 molecule, which is a key determinant of immune responses. IL-10, of course, is generally considered as a very anti-inflammatory uh, cytokine. It's secreted by multiple cell types. And the important thing about IL-10 is that it's a master regulator. It can dictate the type of immune response. And, and, and Speaking sort of in the Th1, Th2 paradigm, the expression of IL-10 can shift an immune response away from a Th1 or a cellular immune response towards a Th2 response, an antibody-based response. And IL-10 is also important in, in the induction of, of regulatory T cells. So IL-10 is a key regulator in a normal immune response to any pathogen or any vaccine. Now, 
because IL-10 has, has a central role affecting multiple cell types, mast cells, eosinophils, B cells, Tregs, and particularly dendritic cells, which Laura talked about earlier. Dendritic cells, are, the function of them, are greatly affected by exposure to cellular IL-10. And because dendritic cells form the link between innate and adaptive immunity, exposure of DC that have processed antigen and migrate to a draining lymph node, because dendritic cells are going to educate in naive T cells, the, the type of cytokines and, and, and molecules that they express are going to influence the adaptive immune response. So if a pathogen wants to affect the long-term adaptive immune response to that pathogen, one key way to do that would be to affect dendritic cells, particularly how they educate uh, naive T cells, and particularly through cellular IL-10. So cellular IL-10 plays a, a central role in, this, in the immune response. And it's not surprising then that there is an accumulating uh, list of pathogens that seem to affect cellular IL-10 signaling during their natural history. And this includes multiple viruses, the cytomegalovirus, human, recent CMV, which I'll talk about, mouse CMV, Epstein-Barr virus, hepatitis B and C viruses, et cetera, et cetera, bacteria, MTB, chlamydia, listeria, protozoa, leishmania, plasmodium species, and fungi. They, the evidence has been presented over the last several years in which they, from either tissue culture studies, animal models, or human studies, these pathogens all seem to affect the IL-10 signaling. And it's not just pathogens that it targets IL-10 signaling during their natural history, natural history. There's also evidence of commensal bacteria setting up a persistent infection by targeting IL-10. So a common theme unifying all these disparate or evolutionary divergent pathogens is that, <coughs> excuse me, all these, all these pathogens or commensal bacteria manipulate the IL-10 signaling pathway to enable states of immune tolerance, immune privilege, and immune suppression. And by doing this, all these pathogens, and these are all persistent pathogens, we got a dying laser here. All these pathogens uh, manipulate the IL-10 signaling to facilitate a persistent infection. So if one wants to perhaps prevent a persistent infection by a prophylactic intervention or therapeutically treat an ongoing infection, this pathway may be the salient molecule one wants to manipulate to change the pathogen host balance. Okay, now, all of these pathogens that I've listed, except those circled in red, they do not encode their own interleukin-10 molecule. They all target cellular IL-10. The primate CMVs, and I list human CMV and recent CMV, and another herpes virus, Epstein-Barr virus, all encode their own viral IL-10 molecule. So they express viral IL-10 in the context of viral infection, but they also manipulate at the same time cellular IL-10. So are these things, is, what, what's the evidence maybe that viral IL-10 is important, or manipulation of IL-10 is important uh, for viral natural history? So this is a paper from uh, Carl Ware group several years ago looking at murine cytomegalovirus. And basically they show that manipulation of cellular IL-10 is critical for establishing persistence. And I hope you all can see this, but what they do is they infect black sea mice, uh, so C57 mice, and they look at the level of CD4 cells expressing IL-10, either in the drain, salivary gland draining lymph node, the spleen, or the salivary gland. Now, for a mouse CMV infection, the virus sets up a persistent infection within the salivary gland. That's where the virus sets up shop long term. During infection, the virus is cleared fairly rapidly from the spleen. And in the draining lymph node and in the spleed, there are basically background levels of CD4 cells expressing IL-10. But in the salivary gland, where the virus sets up shop, there is a very prominent number, percentage of CD4 cells expressing IL-10. So within the site where the virus sets up persistence, there is a large number of CD4 cells expressing viral IL-10. Now, um, they, the, the Humphreys et al. did the, what they tried to do was disrupt that manipulation of the IL-10 pathway. And what they did was they gave, uh, they infused with a, a monoclonal antibody that blocked the IL-10 receptor 
to which IL-10 binds. And what they show here is that if you give, um, if you infuse a, a neutralizing antibody to the IL-10 receptor and look in the salivary gland, what you see is a significant increase in um, uh, uh, C, the, the number of CD4 cells within the salivary gland. And of those, there's a significant increase of CD4 cells expressing gamma interferon. So by blocking the IL-10 signaling pathway with this monoclonal antibody, you get an increase in CD4 effector cells secreting gamma interferon. Um, okay. Now this is another, so that says, again, you know, the virus infection is associated with the manipulation, perhaps, of CD4, or IL-10 secretion from CD4 cells in the salivary gland, and you can reverse that by blocking the IL-10 signaling pathway. In, when, you also in, when you also infuse the monoclonal antibody to viral IL-10, and you look at viral load in the salivary gland, you, if you look at different time points after infection, what you get is a significant reduction in viral loads within the salivary gland, either a few days after the infusion of the antibody or long term. So again, you block the IL-10 pathway, you block, you, you, you change effector cell function, you reduce viral loads. And another paper, this one's with LCMV from Mike Goldstone's lab, looking at LCMV infections clone uh, 13. Um, and this is, again, if you look at, um, this is looking at viral loads for LCMV. If you, if you infect and you look at uh, uh, virus in, the, in serum, and after you do infection, you give a monoclonal antibody to the IL-10 receptor on days one or day five. Again, what you find is that there is a, an acute reduction in viral loads in the blood after the antibody treatment, and long-term, again, a significant reduction. So you block the signaling pathway, you, affect the, you, you, you increase the ability of the host to control viral loads. Um, if you give the monoclonal antibody day 12 after infection, the results are not as dramatic. But again, you see significant drops in viral load. So what this says, what this says is that clearly you block this pathway during acute infection, during the establishment of persistence, you have a greater chance of uh, controlling viral loads. But also you can still have an effect with an established infection. Now one of the things about persistent infection, and persist in a vaccine, for a persistent infection is the holy grail for all vaccines. There are no therapeutic vaccines to, to, to eliminate a persistent infection. And then from another paper from Mike Goldstone's lab, also working with uh, uh, LCMV infection, one of the things that they said, and they're not, they didn't use IL-10 signaling, but what they said is that the immune response to a pathogen is not fixed and immutable. The system is still capable of being educated. And here they used antiviral drugs, but they quote, they said, the functional programming of T cell effector and memory responses in vivo and mice is not hardwired during priming, but is alterable and responsive to continuous instruction from the antigenic environment. As a direct consequence, dysfunctional T cells can be functionally reactivated during persistent infection, even after initial program of an activation has been instituted. So the pathogens don't always have the upper hand, at least from these mouse studies, there is hope that we can uh, do that. So let me talk about herpes virus real quick as I shift into uh, what we're doing. So the thing about herpes viruses, and this is, um, is that they are ancient viruses. They have been around uh, a long time. So this is a paper from Duncan McGee's group in 1995. They just compared protein sequences from different herpes viruses, alpha, beta, and gamma at that time, and doing different analysis, bootstrap analysis, and nearest neighbors and stuff. What they found is that the progenitor herpes virus is around 200 to 240 million years old. These are ancient viruses. And to put that into perspective, you know, we came out of the trees and started up and walking upright about six and a half million years ago. So this is an ancient virus. They've been around. They've encountered countless physical, innate, and adaptive barriers. And the fact that they're still around means they're really good at what they do. And by comparing, <clears throat> excuse me, comparing the structure of the capsid shell, it suggests that herpes viruses entailed phage DNA bacteriophage may have a common origin, which would push back this origin 100 million years earlier. So these things are, uh, are, are old timers, but the fact that they're still around to infect us, let alone cause disease, means that they are really good at what they do. So uh, I won't go through the natural history. Laura Hertel gave an excellent overview. But again, I want to emphasize just a couple points that she made. 
So with human CMV, it has generally low pathogenic potential, potential immune competent host disease is the rare outcome, which means our immune system does its job. We as a species contain this pathogen, we live to reach breeding age, and we maintain the species. If we didn't, we'd die out. Um, but again, the virus sets up a lifelong asymptomatic persistence, which means the virus persists in these immune responses which limit pathogenic potential. So the virus doesn't care, as it was said in the first talk, it doesn't want to make us sick, it just wants to get into a host, make a bunch of new viruses, and go affect a bunch of other people. Now, this lifelong asymptomatic persistence I'll show in just a minute requires a massive host immune response, and I'll show you in just a minute. And one thing about CMV, again, why it's so successful, um, is that it can reinfect those with prior human CMV immunity. So the virus, if it encounters a person that's already been infected, <clears throat> it's pretty darn efficient at getting past that, that, that the, the prior immune responses and setting up an immune, an immune uh, setting up an infection. Okay, so the host, to maintain a massive immune response, uh, to maintain an asymptomatic infection, devotes an extraordinarily large amount of its coding repertoire, immune repertoire, to this pathogen. This is a study, Sylvester et al. from Lewis Picker's lab up in Oregon, and they basically mapped uh, in 32 long-term healthy carriers, HCMV carriers, the entire HCMV proteome requiring something like 14,000 overlapping peptides. And what they find on average is that in healthy long-term carriers, about 10% of memory CD4 cells and 10% of memory CD8 cells are devoted to this one pathogen. I mean, that's, that's like so staggering, it's, it's almost difficult to comprehend. But this is what it takes to keep this virus from being, from causing disease. When, when as Laura said, when, when people are, undergo transplantation, they're immunosuppressed, if CD, CD4 and CD8 numbers drop, virus, you can, get a, you can get a fulminant infection or an AIDS uh, uh, immune deficiency. So again, <clears throat> the steady state balance between the virus and the host requires a large cost on part of, I say cost, but devotion of, um, uh, of, of immune repertoire, T cell repertoire to this pathogen. And, and that opens up other studies in terms of immune senescence as we age, which I won't get into that. Okay. So, uh, you know, Laura again said a large percentage of the CMV genome can be deleted uh, without impairing replication of fibroblasts, and these are just different studies, too, in human CMV saying how many of the open reading frames can be deleted, that virus will still replicate. This is just a study, and some of those, one of those studies was done here at Berkeley. This just shows it's comparable for uh, rhesus CMV you can delete 60% of the genome. So, what that means is, uh, as Laura said, many of these re open reading frames that can be deleted without repairing replication. Fibroblasts means that they encode molecule proteins, viral proteins involved for specific host cell tropism. But it also, a large percentage uh, uh, of the reading frames that can be deleted encode proteins that modulate the host immune system. They modulate cell signaling, cell activation, cell trafficking, antigen presentation, and, and lifespan of the infected cell. This virus is loaded to the gills with things that modulate our immune system, and that's what you expect from an from a ancient virus. So, um, and this is, so, you know, our immune system, and the other physical barriers, the innate and adaptive barriers, present a very high threshold for success. And for this virus to succeed, it's undergone a lot of Darwinian selection. This is just from the origin of species. Um, you know, there's natural selections, daily and hourly scrutinizing through the world every variation, throwing out that's bad, but keeping that which is good. So this is just a figure from uh, ASM Virology Journal just showing a sort of a prototypical immune response. But not surprisingly, those things in circles are things that CMV is known to target. It targets just about everything we throw at it. And that's what enables this virus host uh, 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 balance. Okay, so what are the mechanistic role of these proteins in the human host? Well, we, human CMV doesn't have an animal model you can study in tissue culture, but you take advantage of animal models when you can. And so we work with the monkey model uh, using rhesus CMV infection of rhesus macaques. And two studies suggest the, the important role these proteins probably play in vivo. So this is a study that we published a couple years ago, and, and um, what we did was we took rhesus CMV, and we deleted the viral IL-10 gene. And then we inoculated animals subcutaneously, either with that deleted version or the parental virus, which expressed viral IL-10. Without showing you the data, what we found is that when you 
inoculate with the IL-10 knockout. Deletion of the recent CMV encoded viral IL-10 gene in inoculation of uninfected macaques leads to increased inflammation at the site of inoculation when the absence of IL-10 seven days later, a change in the type of inflammatories that show up to viral antigens seven days later. When you inoculate with the IL-10 knockout, you increase recent CMV-specific T cells in the draining lymph node, at, lymph node at two weeks, and you get increased recent CMV-specific antibody responses circulating in the periphery. So knocking out viral IL-10 changes both innate immunity and adaptive immunity, which is what, you would predict, what one would predict um, from the nature of viral IL-10. So this says, again, viral IL-10 by itself changes both innate and adaptive immunity. And just another example of, of how viral immune modulating proteins function in vivo in the primate host. This is a study from Klaus Prue's lab up at Oregon. And what they did was they deleted a, a series of genes called US2 through 11. Now, in human CMV and in recent CMV, the US2 through 11 gene co encode proteins that interfere with class 1 antigen presentation. And what they showed is that when they knocked out the rhesus US2 through 11 genes, they were able to successfully infect an animal that had been uninfected with a rhesus CMV. So this virus could establish primary infection. But what they showed was when you delete the US2 through 11 genes, this virus is no longer able to reinfect a rhesus CMV immune host. So when you take the parental virus that expresses US2 through 11, you can get reinfection. You can get it very efficiently with as low as 10 plaque forming units of virus. But when you knock out these genes, you cannot get reinfection. So this starts to give an idea of what some of these viral proteins do within, within a primate host. So switching now to what we're working on, we asked the question, okay, well, viral IL-10 is so important. Um, we made the hypothesis that, hypothesis that immunization against HCMV encoded IL-10 ortholog, CMV IL-10, will significantly inhibit establishment of a persistent HCMV infection. So we worked with the monkey model of IL-10, excuse me, the monkey model of human CMV, and we focused on the recent CMV encoded IL-10 protein. Now to give you some background about these viral IL-10s, human CMV and recent CMV IL-10 are trans, you know, they, all the evidence says they were originally transduced cellular genes. But over the ages, they've undergone considerable genetic drift so that they only retain only about 25% protein identity with their host cellular IL-10. So they're very divergent. Despite this, though, despite this great sequence divergent, functionally, as far as we can tell, they're identical to the cellular IL-10. So very divergent in sequence, no, no divergence in function, except that our colleague, Mark Walter at University of Alabama, Birmingham, showed that the human CMV IL-10 binds to the IL-10 receptor with higher affinity than cellular IL-10. It outcompetes cellular IL-10. And we think that's probably what's driving the sequence, what drove the sequence diversion. Okay. So what we did, so this is just a, a, a work that Mark Walter published several years ago showing uh, crystal structure of viral IL-10, human CMV IL-10 right here, bound to soluble IL-10 receptor in comparison with the crystal structure of cellular IL-10 bound to the IL-10 receptor. And there's some difference in the angles and things like that, um, but um, based on these structures, what Mark did in collaboration with us is that he identified points of contact between viral IL-10 and the receptor such that mutations within certain key amino acids would block binding of the viral IL-10 to the, to the receptor. And our goal was to immunize against viral IL-10, but we didn't want to immunize with functional IL-10s. So we wanted to block or ablate function, but still get an immune response. So based on these structures, two-point mutations were engineered into the CMV IL-10, and we created two versions of mutated rhesus CMV IL-10 called M1 and M2. These proteins do not bind to the IL-10 receptor and have no functionality on, on, on rhesus lymphoid cells. So this just shows an assay, a bioassay, showing that it doesn't bind to the receptor. This is the cell type, TF1, which, which, is, which stably expresses the IL-10 receptor. Growth of these cells is dependent on 
on, on IL-10 binding to the receptor. So as you have increasing concentrations of cellular IL-10, you get increased proliferation. Similarly, if you had increasing concentrations of wild-type rhesus seen by IL-10, you get increases in proliferation. Our two mutants, M1 and M2, even at you know, 1,000 nanograms per mil, cause no stimulation of these cells. So these mutants do not bind to the IL-10 receptor. Three minutes. Oh, Lordy. Okay, and they have no functionality. Okay. Um, okay, so, uh, okay, so here's our study. You got all that. I'll, I can happily answer questions. Okay, so what we did is we took uninfected macaques. We immunized them once with DNA three times with the M1 and M2 mutant proteins. Uh, we challenged subcutaneously IM um, with a epithelial endothelial trophic strain, a virus with a very low titer virus. And then we collected samples and, and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I apologize for the, uh, the, the haste with this. I tried to say too much. Um, let me back up. The point I want to make is by immunization, we got antibodies in the vaccinees that binding antibodies, and we also got antibodies that neutralized IL-10 function. That was the goal, block IL-10 function. Um, and so then we challenged, um, uh, again, I apologize for the nature of this. Okay, one of the things that we noticed was we inoculated subcutaneously, took a biopsy of the skin site one week later. On the right are two of the vaccinees. On the left are the controls. And these are representative slides. What you see, though, in the unvaccinated controls, there's a much greater inflammatory response composed primarily of, uh, of uh, uh, PMNs, neutrophils, and the vaccinees, varying levels of inflammation, but less than the unvaccinated controls. Okay, now the important thing. Do we change the establishment of an infection? So what we did was we sampled saliva um, in the vaccinees and, and sampled saliva every week or every two weeks in the controls. And what's shown here is detection of recent CMV DNA in saliva post recent CMV challenge. In the controls, this is a typical pattern. Once they start shedding, they start shedding what can be very high copy number of CMV within saliva. It, can, it generally remains stable over time. In our vaccinees, two of the vaccinees immunized against recent CMV IL-10 did not shed in saliva at all. The other two animals shed for very brief periods of time at greatly reduced magnitude. We also looked at urine. In the, in the, in the controls, varying levels of uh, detection of recent CMV in urine, but it was generally detected multiple time points. In our vaccinees, three of them did not secrete virus in urine at all. One did it sporadically. So we summarized both the frequency of detection What's shown here. So here we look at the frequency, and you know, yes or no, did we detect virus in saliva, vaccinees, and control, in saliva, urine, and then if we add it all together, bottom line, we see a significant reduction in the frequency of shedding merely by blocking this immune modulating protein, by immunizing against this immune modulating protein. If we look at the magnitude of shedding by doing an area under the curve for those graphs I just shown, again, if you take the total amount of virus detected in saliva and urine shown over here. Again, a significant reduction in the magnitude of virus coming out of these inoculated animals. With one animal, never, we never detected any virus. So immunization of naive macaques with the non-functional forms of rhesus CMV induced strong binding and neutralizing titers, alters the inflammatory inf infiltrate, and significantly reduces the frequency and magnitude of rhesus CMV in saliva and urine. So, our conclusion is vaccine-induced neutralization of rhesus CMV IL-10 functionality has fundamentally altered the phenotype of persistent rhesus CMV infection, i.e. shedding. So I'll stop there. Oh, I just want to say, um, I have to skip ahead. To every, thank you to the people in the lab that do the work, um, particularly, well, Megan, Megan Everhart, who did all the work, and our collaborator, Mark Walter, at University of Alabama, Birmingham. Thank you. I have one question, actually. If you look at, you look at shading, in fact, but if you look at latency, I mean, in the hematopoietic stem cells, if that affect the primary infections? And yeah, that, that's a good question. The answer is no. We have not looked at whether established, you know, CD34 yeah, exactly. positive. Yeah, no. And, and 
direct inoculation is, is really a, a tough, yeah. that's a tough challenge for the, uh -huh. for the vaccine. But no, we haven't done that. Uh, what's the mechanism of protection in the animals? We, our hypothesis is that by neutralizing viral IL-10 function, the innate and adaptive immune cells can control the virus better. They can do, they can do their job. The immune system can do its job. So have you tested for any of those functions? Have we tested? So, so you have more helper activity we, or more cytotoxic? Yes, a limited analysis so far is that there are increased T cells. But that's about all we can say. Yeah, the T cells specific to CMV. Yeah. Yeah, so good question. So the question is, since disease is, in, you know, human CME disease is mainly in the context of congenital infection or an immunosuppressed transplant recipient, what would I expect if we immunosuppressed these monkeys? Um, if, if protection is mediated primarily by neutralizing antibodies, we might still be able to protect infection from reactivation. But we haven't done that. It's a good question. Good question. Uh, all right, so let me play devil's advocate. Um, you know, I have a direct line to him. Uh, so uh, I understand the importance of uh, uh, removing CMV and herpes virus uh, uh, morbidity, morbidity, maybe mortality in case of immunocompromised and, uh, uh, and immunosuppressed uh, people. But I think Skip Virgin uh, argued uh, some, at some point uh, recently that uh, herpes viruses also keep our immune systems uh, agile, I guess. Uh, do you foresee any negative consequences of, uh, of lowering um, CMV? Yeah, so the, so the issue is Skip Virgin uh, has done studies showing in mouse CMV that, that long-term infection with mouse CMV protects against uh, lethal infection with listeria and yersinia. So the question is, would, would we expect something similar with, with rhesus or human CMV? Um, you know, we have monkey colony that are, are herpes virus free, and uh, we haven't seen any increases in things like listeria or yersinia infections, which they are exposed to. Now, is it not long enough? It's been nine years, but I don't know. Um, it's an interesting question. You don't mess with Mother Nature. I mean, something's going to fill the void, but I, I don't know. You know, it's, it's a question we have to keep in mind about thinking about. Thank you. Okay. <laughs>